Dear Marnie, I can't imagine how this letter will reach you, can't even imagine where you are, so this story is really for me, not you. I'm writing everything down in as much detail as I can muster because I need to hold on to what's real. For a long time all I wanted was to forget, and even now, years later, a part of me still wishes that everything which happened would fade away like a bad dream. I guess I'm starting to realize that ignoring your past doesn't always heal your scars, and that leaving monsters to writhe in the deep only helps until they're hauled to the surface. I've avoided writing because recording things has a way of making them concrete, and it's easier to cross a shadow than a wall. But things are starting to slip away from me, details becoming elusive, and I need something solid to hold. Something to rely on when things are so bad I can't trust my mind. Anyway, enough rambling. Before I begin I should let you know that I miss you dearly, and hope that you are safe and happy wherever you are wandering. I hope that you still think of me, from time to time. I know it's a selfish thing to wish for, but I even hope that you miss me. I sure as hell miss you. As for me, I'm sitting on a grimy bed in some crap house motel room about an hour away from the nearest city. I hope you'll forgive me for not including the name of the city. It's a little like that room we had in Logan. I chose this place because it was cheap and didn't ask for identification, and because there were bars on the windows and a big padlock on the door. God, I must sound like a freaking lunatic, but I think you'll understand once you hear how everything started. Start at the beginning, that's the normal place, right? Sometimes I think it's hard to tell where one story ends and another begins. Where does my story start? As far back as my memory stretches? With my birth? My conception? Doesn't every story ultimately go back forever along the chain of causation, right back to the beginning of existence? Freak, I'm rambling again. I haven't been sleeping too well lately. I suppose this story begins when I decided to embark on a journey. You might remember I was studying law at the time, gradually burning out, like a broken engine never moving, instead just smoldering and buzzing and choking for purpose. I was working a dead-end job to support a degree I despised, and one day I just snapped and left the country in the hopes of spending a few months alive. I traveled alone through Asia, well, sprinted through Asia, seeing innumerable wonders though the retreating rearview mirror of my car, before finally succumbing to the loneliness of the solo traveler's life and settling down to spend a few months in Goa, a beautiful state on the west coast of India. All I desired was some friends with whom I could find some simple joys, or failing that, somebody to share my loneliness with. Goa is a small state, and I decided to slowly make my way down the coast, moving from one stunning beach town to the next whenever restlessness reared its head. After a few weeks of wandering I found myself in a town called Benalem. Perched on the beach and cradled by jungle, Benalem is a seaside village so sleepy it would be more accurately described as comatose. It was in Benalem that I first met Barry, who would become so inextricably entwined in what was to follow. Barry was an Irishman, older than me by about ten years, cursed with prematurely gray hair and an almost unquenchable flair for the dramatic. We met when he stumbled up to my car and told me, in a thick Irish accent, that he had only hours to live before the thirst takes me. I immediately took a liking to him, and after sharing some bottled water, he complained that it was too warm to be drinkable, was I trying to freaking kill him, we set off to find somewhere to stay. We met a native on the road who owned a bar and some beach huts at opposite ends of the town, and he promised us cheap beer and Russian girls, and kept on lowering the accommodation price until refusal plainly wasn't an option. We paid for the keys to the two huts and headed straight for the beach. When we climbed out of the waves a couple of hours later, it was beginning to get dark. Barry wandered off towards town to grab his rented jeep and bring it to the nearby clearing, while I lay on the dunes and watched the gorgeous Indian sunset cast fire across the waves. Behind me, the view was no less stunning. There is no such thing as a gradual transition in Goa, and the beaches lurch directly into lush jungles before rearing into jagged cliffs and cascading down as waterfalls. As I absorbed the scenery, I thought that I spotted a figure perched on the edge of the jungle, and I gave a quick wave. It was getting too dark to make out any kind of response though, and after a moment I turned back to the view. 
It wasn't until later that it struck me that this was the first and only person we'd seen since leaving the village. Barry still wasn't back. I checked the time on my phone and realized it had been almost half an hour. He was going to honk when he arrived. I contemplated searching for him, but didn't fancy walking through the Indian jungle in the dark and decided to stay put for the time being. The palm trees which lined the beach, so beautiful during the day, began to cast shadows like giant hands across the sand, and for the first time I began to feel uneasy. The walk to Barry's car shouldn't be taking this long, surely, I struggled to remember how long the walk to the beach had been. It didn't feel this long. I kept glancing over to where I'd seen the figure at the fringe of the beach, but I saw nothing but the jungle, squirming in the wind. I waited. Almost an hour had elapsed by now, and Barry still hadn't returned. My skin was beginning to prickle by this point, and I was sweating in the cold. Why hadn't the figure I'd seen passed me? Was there another way to the beach, one that I wasn't aware of? The trail back to the car was partially overgrown, and it occurred to me that it would be very easy to get lost in the darkness. I pictured Barry alone in the crawling jungle, becoming more lost and frantic by the minute. An hour was far too long. It suddenly hit me that I had to get help. Idiotically, I hadn't recorded any of the local contact numbers, so I decided to carefully make my way back to Barry's car, from where I could follow the road to the local police station. By this point, the wind was picking up and causing an eerie moan to echo through the jungle, and the idea of walking the narrow trail in the dark sent shivers down my spine. I hadn't really left myself any other options, so I headed for the path. The sand was thick and dry, the kind that squeaks when you step on it, and it was slightly easier than I expected to find and follow the path. The moon was low and bright, and it was possible to make out Barry's returning footprints along the trail. I kept my head low to the ground and focused on the prints, walking quickly and willing myself to ignore the sounds of the jungle around me. After a while I stopped jumping at every cracking branch and twig, although the sudden bark of a wild dog still made me freeze. The sand was more sheltered from the wind further in the jungle, and the tracks became clearer. Two sets of footprints towards the beach, where we'd walked from the car. Two sets headed back. Barry and I. Two sets of. I remember stopping dead. Two sets of footprints before me, headed towards the car. I looked behind me. Three sets of footprints. Three sets. Had Barry lost the track and doubled back? If he had, I hadn't noticed it. When had the third set materialized? I walked faster now, my heart throbbing louder than the wind. I wanted to run, but was afraid to lose the trail. Something hissed near my foot and I'm ashamed to say that I lost it. I sprinted as hard as I could in the direction of the car. Vines and bushes grabbed at my legs. My heart beat in my ears, like footsteps closing in. I glanced over my shoulder, glimpsed movement behind me, and almost choked with terror. All I wanted was to be out of the jungle. Trees flew past, the trail was nowhere to be seen, I had no idea which direction I was going, footsteps in my ears. A car horn cut through the night. The signal that Barry was at the clearing. Almost choking with relief, I followed the noise and suddenly I was in the clearing, Barry's headlights illuminating the jungle. I looked behind me and saw movement, but nothing else, just the wind and the trees. I jumped into the car, and Barry shot me a bemused glance. Flat tire, I didn't have your number. Christ, you look like you just seen a freaking ghost. I grinned, too glad to be pissed off at the delay. Barry was here, and everything was okay. I told him about the footprints, and he shrugged it off. Kids played in the area, and we'd been swimming for a long time. Barry wanted to check out the bar before we retired to bed, so we drove back along the beach road. The Russian girls were a lie, but thankfully the cheap beer wasn't. I ordered a local Kingfisher beer. Barry stared at the young guy working the bar for a moment, as if struggling to decide what to order. Make me a drink like you'd make for a man with nothing left to live for. But more cheery. Some passion for beauty in it. With lots of ice. The bartender stared hopelessly at Barry, who eventually relented with a grunt. I'll take a freaking whiskey. Lots of ice. 
We sat around and talked about nothing late into the night, and finally decided to head back and check out the huts we had rented. I wanted to hire a rickshaw, but neither of us had thought to save money for the trip home, so we took the jeep instead. Barry insisted on driving, claiming he was too drunk to navigate. I pointed out some subtle flaws in this logic, but he shook it off and climbed into the driver's seat and we set off. The road back to our cabin was surprisingly active for this time of night. We passed a cluster of motorcycles, a dirty old truck with dark tinted windows, several rickshaws, and even a man riding a brightly adorned camel, which marched wearily through the humid night. The cabin was some distance away from the town, and we followed the road up into the tropical mountains which wound around the coast. The ocean looked serene and infinite in the moonlight, and for a long time I just sat and let it all wash through me, a big dumb grin plastered across my face. The road grew narrower and more twisted as it descended. Barry drove excruciatingly slowly down the mountains, and I wasn't surprised to hear the sound of an engine behind us. When I turned to look, though, my throat tightened. Barry, is that the same truck as before? He turned to look, frowning in confusion. Yeah, the one with the black ass crap windows. Wasn't it going the other direction? We reached the bottom of the mountain, and I told Barry to speed up. He did, and so did the truck. Suddenly, I had an incredibly bad feeling about the truck, like a fist clenching my gut. I'd heard stories of the robberies in India, and I placed my hand on the knife in my pocket, fiddled with it nervously. At least we were almost at the hut's dash. Crap. Oh, crap. Barry, you have to turn around. I don't know what this guy is doing, but we can't lead him to where we live. Just in case. It's probably harmless, but this is India and I don't want to take chances. Maybe he'll just leave. As if on cue, the truck behind us sped up and cleanly overtook us, pushing into the curtain of night in front of us. I let out a sigh of relief. The truck wasn't following us, after all. Two false alarms in one night had my nerves tingling, and I was keen to get home. Barry slowed down, and I gradually settled back into enjoying the scenery. Ahead of us, the truck slammed on its brakes. Barry bellowed a garbled string of swears, somehow swerving around the truck and only barely clipping it with the rear end of the jeep. Behind us the truck's engine roared and it drew level with us, before swinging across and ramming the side of the jeep hard enough to shake my teeth, almost pushing us off the road. Up ahead a streetlight turned red, and Barry cursed and began to slow down. Go through it! I screamed, and he accelerated through the light, pursued by the truck. Barry took the first turn he saw, almost skidding out on the sandy road, and barreled along in front of the truck until we came to a crossroad with a stop sign in front of it. I saw to my horror that the intersecting road was one of the busiest highways in Goa, and barely had time to register that there would still be plenty of traffic on that road before Barry barreled through it, somehow missing all oncoming cars and careening to the other side of the road. I looked behind us, just as the truck slowed to a stop at the sign. It didn't start again. Somehow that was the worst part of the whole thing. The truck just sat there, with big gaps in the traffic passing it by, as we drove off into the night. For the first time since finding Barry, I felt real fear. Whoever was inside just sat there and watched us leave. I don't know why. We took the most roundabout route we could determine and eventually found ourselves at the huts, shaken and exhausted by the failed robbery attempt. We'd rented separate huts, accommodation in India is so cheap it might as well be free, and agreed to meet again in the morning to speak to the police about the robbery. Barry retired to his room, and shortly I did the same. The hut didn't help my frazzled nerves. It was large and surprisingly luxurious, with modern air conditioning and fully furnished rooms. However, in my shaken state of mind, everything seemed dark and frightful, and I settled into the hut without the faintest hint of relaxation. The potted plant on the window was beginning to wilt in the heat, and it reminded me of the clutching jungle. The furniture was old and wooden and gnarled, and the brightly colored beach towels provided seemed strange and deceitful. Even the ticking of the ancient clock set me on edge. Worst of all were the paintings. One depicted the beach during a glorious sunset, it would have been soothing, but all I could picture was the figure on the fringes of the beach. 
The other was worse. It was a portrait hung opposite the bed, depicting a man staring through the eye of a camera, with a wide grin which stretched across his face without ever touching his eyes. The camera made me think he was supposed to be a tourist, but something about the painting suggested a leering menace, the way the top lip curled into a sneer, the way the eyes seemed to follow you, as many old paintings do. The coldness of those eyes, which almost seemed to beckon the viewer closer. I lay in bed for a while, before the portrait's malevolent stare proved too much and I moved to sleep on the couch. When I finally managed to slip into an uneasy slumber, after what felt like hours of tossing and turning, my dreams were plagued with shadowy figures. Storms interrupted by flashes of white lightning, drivers without eyes and paintings that grinned without smiling. In the morning I grabbed a sheet and headed into the bedroom, determined to cover the painting and reclaim my bed. But when I stepped into the room, all I could do was stare at the portrait. No. Not a portrait. Just an open window. I need to go now. It's getting light outside, and I've been here too long already. I will write to you again as soon as I can. 